Hello, everybody. <laughs> Good morning. Um, so welcome to uh, What the Fuzz, uh, introducing fuzz testing by myself, Josh Grant. Um, Oh, it works. Oh, this is going to be a good talk. You're going to love it. Okay. Um, so uh, just a little bit about me. So I am Josh Grant. Um, I, am, um, I have been working in test automation for about 13 years, um, doing lots of stuff. If you've heard of uh, Selenium WebDriver, I've worked a lot with that. If you've heard of, <laughs> if you've heard of APIs, I've worked with that. Um, all this kind of stuff. I'm a Pythonista, um, all this fun stuff. And I live in uh, wonderful Toronto, Ontario. It's across the lake. Um, yeah, so you're familiar with it. Now here's a beautiful picture of it. Um, so yeah, so, uh, and today I'll be talking about fuzzing. <laughs> so, so quick show of hands. How many people have heard of fuzzing or fuzz testing? Okay, almost all of you, that's super. And how many people have, have actually uh, done it or under, undertaken some kind of fuzzing? Okay, almost everyone, okay. So hopefully this talk will be good. Okay, um, all right, great. So, okay, so, so today's topic is, is fuzz testing. What is it, how does it work, um, and how to use it for fun and for profit? So um, I guess I'll be honest, I'm, I'm, co I'm coming at this from a test automation perspective. Uh, I think it's super cool use of test automation. Um, I, I'm less familiar with it as kind of a security or um, application security uh, approach. So uh, hopefully you'll learn something good today. So what is fuzzing? It all started on a dark and stormy night in Wisconsin. This is 100% true. So I love this introduction. So um, there is a professor at the University of Wisconsin um, uh, Professor Barton Miller uh, in the computer science department. And in 1988, 1989, he was working one night, again, uh, uh, definitely a progressive person working from home. And he was working from his home office and connecting to the university network uh, via a modem, uh, you know, which was not something everyone did in the late 80s. And one night he was working so he would connect uh, and retrieve files or, or send data to and from the university network where he's working in his home office. But it was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> this is true. So it was actually raining. Uh, there was a lot of precipitation. And he was actually experiencing some networking issues uh, during this storm. And he did some testing, did some debugging, and realized it was actually from the storm and either it was an electrical storm or some kind of a, um, like precipitation, and it was actually causing some issues in the connection. It was um, causing some extra fuzzy fuzziness in his connection. So there was extra static going over the wire or something like this. And so what he found is he would drop his connection during the storm, only during the storm. Other nights when it was clear and there was there was no um, no storm or anything. It was fine. So he figured out it was actually because of the storm. So it was actually that he realized the network connection wasn't as solid as he thought it would be, and that if you added this extra fuzzy fuzziness or a fuzzy input, um, you could actually you know trigger bugs in your network software. So he could actually he actually realized that his his network connection wasn't as, as solid as he thought it would be. Surprise, surprise! There's bugs in software. Um, so, so this is pretty cool. <laughs> this is pretty interesting. Um, kind of reminds me of a story where <laughs> I was I was just thinking about this. Um, I was working at this company, and we used to have an all hands, and um, it was it was a small enough company. We'd all stand up, and so one time the IT guy literally came behind me, put his hands on me, and moved me over like about a foot, and said, "People block Wi-Fi." <laughs> so, and then everything worked. So it's kind of like that. So, so Professor Barton got his grad students looking at these kind of fuzzy inputs and trying to figure out how to input fuzzy data, semi-valid data, uh, to find bugs in networking programs. So that was, that was kind of the, the genesis, if you will, um, of fuzz testing or fuzzing. So, so what is fuzzing? So that's, that's kind of the story. I like the story. I like any story that starts on a dark and stormy night, especially when it actually starts on a dark and stormy night. 
Um, so fuzzing is an automated testing technique uh, where you send in semi-valid or, or kind of semi-random, quasi-random inputs, fuzzy inputs. Um, and these are generated and passed into a piece of software to, to find bugs or security vulnerabilities. Okay, so and you're all very familiar with this. This is this is good. So so thinking of things in terms of strings, if you have a string type, like this could be a fuzzy input, right? It's kind of semi-random. Um, you've got some kind of semi-invalid things. You've got this open bracket. Could that cause some problems? You have some special characters mixed in with alphanumeric characters, something like this. This is how I think about it. Like it's not. I'm sure there are more sophisticated ways to think about it, but kind of fuzzy strings, fuzzy inputs. So, so what is fuzzing? So a fuzzer is a tool that uh, generates fuzzy data. Uh, it, so it generates fuzzy data automatically somehow and then passes it into the system under test or the kind of software under test. Um, so a fuzzer does those two things. It will generate and call your system under test. So sort of pass in this data. So it does those two things. Uh, another term that comes up, fuzz target. So a fuzz target is a function that's actually called by the fuzzer. So in the bad old days of software where you only had C++ and everything was kind of, you didn't have all the nice tooling that you have now for finding issues uh, with, you know, C++ and, you know, memory validation, all this kind of thing. Um, you would just write a function in C or C++ and your compiler or your uh, fuzzer would, would call that and execute that function. So we call that a fuzz target. Um, you could also call this like a test case. Um, if you're outside of kind of the C world, uh, yeah, you could call it like a test case or a fuzzy test case or something like this. But that's what a fuzz target is. Okay, so fuzzers fuzz things. That's what they do. Like, um, it took me a long time to kind of learn this. Um, you know, I'd hear about fuzzing, browser fuzzing, for example, where you'd fuzz a whole browser like Chrome or the Chromium project. Uh, you fuzz a, a C library or C++ library. Like, what does that mean? What do you do? Um, well, fuzzers fuzz things. That's what they do. Um, so, and the simplest fuzzers uh, just generate random input. They just generate random input, um, just like uh, an alphanumeric string or something like this. These are, these have been called by some people dumb fuzzers uh, or simple fuzzers. Um, you just generate random inputs. Uh, and then you call a piece of software with these, and away you go. So I have an example of this. Um, so I'm a Python person, so I get to use Python here. So I'm excited. Um, so an example, uh, using a fuzzing with this tool hypothesis, it's a component testing library, but you can also use it for fuzzing um, to test an encoding function. So I'll kind of show that, I hope. Okay, so here it is. Um, so this is a very, very simple function. Uh, use it basically, you're testing that if you have some kind of JSON uh, JavaScript object notation, so it's a way to kind of write um, like a list of things or an object of things. You you want to verify that if you can if you load up a string as JSON, convert it into JSON, and then you take that JSON and convert it back into a string, you get the same thing. All right, so it's kind of this invariant. Um, like if you're kind of math or computer science inclined, it's like you're looking for an invariant, you're looking for an invariant property. Um, but if you're not thinking that way, just I have a string, it has some brackets and some stuff, I want to convert it into this format, then I want to convert it back and just verify I get the same thing, right? So it's like you know, input, output, nothing changes. Um, and I want to verify that, like I can try that with like basic JSON, like what about an empty JSON? What about like with one entry? What about with nested entries? You could think of all sorts of things, right? You could think of all sorts of things, um, but you could just let test automation do it for you. So, um, so I'm gonna use this. So I have this given text. So it just says, pass in some text um, that looks kind of right, um, and I'll do this. So I create a string, uh, load it into JSON, and then I'm going to, um, uh, or sorry, load string. Yeah, I'm going to load it up as I'm going to load it up as a string as a JSON and then convert it back. Okay, so all right. Okay. 
So I run this, I use PyTest. Uh, it's a great test runner tool for, for Python. It's excellent, I recommend it. Um, with Hypothesis, also cool for component testing if you're into that. Um, so I run it and I get, so I do get an error. So what happens? I get an error. So the test failed. So, so Hypothesis generates all these cases and tries to find something, but it's kind of just random. It's just going to like throw in some alphanumeric things. It's not going to do a whole lot of sophisticated thinking, but it is going to do all the stuff for me. Um, better living through automation. And so it fails with, oh, fails with this input. Turns out, so it tries this empty string. So if I have an empty string, something happens where if I try to load that up and convert it back, I don't get the same thing. I can't gracefully handle that edge case. That's pretty cool. Maybe I didn't think about that, right? Maybe I didn't think about like trying an empty string. Maybe I try an empty uh, JSON object, but not an empty string. So that's pretty neat. So, so fuzzing can kind of do this for you. So you can find bugs. Uh, this is an example of finding a bug. Um, just using sort of dumb fuzzing. I don't like that term, but it's kind of simple fuzzing. Just generally random. Ten minutes? Okay. So computers are pretty good at actually looping through things. Um, so we can go beyond uh, simple fuzzing. So instead of just generating things and executing things, we can do some other stuff. So mutational fuzzers um, are interesting because they take a known good state and they'll mutate it. So maybe you have a string and the string works. It says, hello world, everything works well. And it changes one character at a time, one byte at a time. It adds or subtracts characters, and it mutates that string to generate test cases. Um, so that's one approach, where you start with a known seed, and then you kind of change it once one thing at a time to generate new inputs. You can also do generational fuzzer. So generational fuzzer says, OK, we're going to start with hello world, runs, OK. Now we're going to have hello Josh, OK, runs. Now we're going to do something else. Um, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, okay. And so it will just generate from scratch every time. And computers can do this because they can just generate stuff very quickly and kind of loop through things. So that's nice. Those are two approaches for like generating or, cre sorry, creating more interesting fuzzing techniques beyond just random fuzzing. But people are pretty good too. People are pretty smart with computers. So we've developed things such as feedback-based fuzzing. So feedback-based fuzzing is even more sophisticated, where you actually l you sort of peek inside of your system under test, and you look for um, some interesting test cases. So maybe you start to see, oh, like this, these inputs are slowing down like the execution time, or these inputs are returning longer and longer strings or something like this, we should go in that direction and we should try to figure out, like, you know, or we should try to generate strings in that known direction. So, and I'm giving a very, very basic explanation. Um, I have colleagues that are much smarter at this and know a lot more about this. But that's basically the idea of, like, trying to guide your fuzzer into interesting places uh, for test cases. So this approach uses instrumentation, so you kind of it's kind of a gray, gray box approach where you know a little bit about the system, but not too much, um, in order to test it. So, uh, so this approach, feedback-based fuzzing, uses instrumentation in the software under test to guide the fuzzer towards something interesting. And so now I'm going to show an example. Um, so this is, uh, this is where the code intelligence part comes in. Um, so I'm going to show a method that finds a SQL injection uh, using a feedback-based fuzzer. So, and this will be in Java, unfortunately, so bear with me.
It is. It's very fuzzy. Um, yeah, so it looks like IntelliJ isn't working. Um, wow, that sucks. So I know, live demo. <laughs> this has never happened to me. Um, like, I mean, JetBrains, IntelliJ, uh, smart people, wonderful people. Um, in conclusion, <laughs> so um, what was supposed to what was supposed to happen is I show this this fun function. I'll walk through it. I guess I'll just explain it. Um, so it's and I have the source. You can find it. I'll I'll, I'll share it. Um, so it's this function, and it just takes this Java object and and um, passes it into a SQL database. Um, Pretty standard stuff. Pretty basic things. There's there's some extra logic. You kind of use a use an object. You kind of wrap it into an object in Java, and so this fuzzer calls this function. That's all it does. It just calls this function with um, a, a data a fuzz data provider input. Um, there's not really a lot of thinking. It just it just happens, and it will generate a string automatically that will trigger a SQL injection. So it will trigger like some kind of like um, malicious select statement. Um, just from, from scratch, from nothing. Like it doesn't know anything about the system, it just knows this is a function, it's in Java, that's all it knows. Um, which I think is pretty cool. Like it's just, you can fuzz a system and get like pretty sophisticated, um, or you can find pretty sophisticated bugs and security vulnerabilities just from nothing. Because um, the fuzzers are very good, they're very smart. They're intelligent even. Um, so, Um, so yeah, so please come find me for this example. Um, please don't tell my boss that this happened. Uh, this is really awkward. Um, it is a really cool tool though. Like I, I, I do want to stress like, um, so the fuzzer that's used is um, CI fuzz. It's freely available. Uh, it's based on uh, a fuzzer that my colleagues put together called Jazzer. Um, Jazzer is a Java based fuzzer. Um, doesn't even require a fuzz target. It's pretty cool. Um, but CI fuzz is really neat. Um, strongly recommend it. Um, So, so how to use fuzzing? Um, <coughs> kind of to wrap up a little bit. So, bug detection—that's uh, what I think when I think of fuzzing. So, like unusual edge cases, like what happens when you have an empty string? What happens when you have an empty um, byte or initialized byte or something? Um, memory mismanagement. If you're in the C++ world, this happens a lot. You have to manage mem um, you have to manage memory manually. Um, you can have some memory leaks and all kinds of problems. No pointer issues. You can also find these in Java, which is pretty neat, because these can be kind of annoying to, to deal with as a Java developer. And finding security vulnerabilities. So this is kind of more of the, the topic for today. Um, so finding things like SQL injection attacks, injection attacks, cross-site scripting, memory mismanagement. Again, like you could kind of think of this as a category of security testing. Um, you know, can I pass in uh, like, can I use undefined behavior to crash a system that's written in C++ or something? Uh, and program crashes, uh, which is still a problem. Um, one, of the, um, one of the uses for C++ is in embedded systems programming, so controlling hardware, controlling industrial machinery. Um, so you want to you verify that no one can, for example, um, you know, break into your agricultural facility and crash your cow brushers, which are automated, and which do brush cows to keep them clean um, and run on C++ in part. Um, completely real. So yeah. Um, so I've got a couple of high profile bugs uh, that were found using um, fuzzing. Heartbleed 2016, uh, you're probably pretty familiar with this. Um, uh, in the OpenSSL library, like there's a cryptographic bug, um, huge vulnerability. This was this was actually or can be found with fuzzing. I don't know if it was found in fuzzing in 2016, but it can be pretty effectively. Um, and log for shell. This is the logo I found for it. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I thought there'd be a cool logo, and I got this. Um, uh, yeah, log for shell. Uh, now, two years ago, log for j, log for shell. You can use fuzzing to find this as well. You can use fuzzing to find 
uh, log4j uh, exploits. Um, what did I see somewhere? Like you know, your light bulbs might be susceptible to this if you have smart light bulbs. And I was like, oh my god, I don't want to deal with this. Um, so anyway, so so yeah, another another. So these are two very very high-profile exploits, um, but both can can be found using fuzzing, um, and may have been found using fuzzing. All right, so in <laughs> sorry. Um, so in conclusion, so fuzzing is really cool. I think it's really cool. It's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting use of test automation. It's really a neat use of uh, computer programming, um, and you can use it for a whole array of finding bugs or finding security exploits. Um, and if you'd like to actually see that example that I wasn't able to show, uh, you know, you can go to this GitHub uh, project, uh, RoadSmart. It's a very simple kind of um, CRUD application. Uh, definitely pr play around with it. Um, you can scan this to download CI Fuzz if you want, um, or whatever. So, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm here to around. I have some stickers. I will take questions. Uh, yeah, thank you for coming. <laughs>